Okay guys, we've got about 20 minutes just now that we're going to go through doing our chapter 5 section of Gatsby. Uh, yesterday, obviously, we'd got to the stage, or just before this, we'd got to the stage where we were looking specifically at what we'd learned about Gatsby so far as a character. Uh, the other thing that we were looking at was the past that was being sort of revealed here between Daisy and Gatsby at the end of chapter 4, where we can see that the two of them have not only met before, but they've had this kind of romantic entanglement uh, back before the war. We heard yesterday then that Gatsby had been sent away to, to go and serve. And as he had done so, we know that Daisy had tried to make it to New York to go and see him off uh, before he disappeared off for the war, but that she was stopped by her family. We then got into a situation where many years have passed and she ends up being hooked up with Tom Buchanan at that stage there on the night of the wedding, really, or the night before the wedding, with these beautiful hundreds of thousands of pounds in today's money, pearls round her neck, she gets a letter. We assume the letter is from Gatsby. We assume it is saying that he is home, he's tracked her down, he would like to marry her, or they'd like to kind of restart this romantic entanglement. But of course, having broken down, she then gets to a stage where she's forced, essentially, to marry Tom. It seems to be a relationship which then goes quite well, but years later... Gatsby suddenly appears back on the scene and we know that he's been starting these parties uh, to great expense and to a huge amount of effort that he may have been doing these parties opposite Daisy's place and in fact he may have bought this mansion because of its location in the hope that Daisy would one night just wander in with everybody else and that they would rekindle their relationship. <coughs> Okay, so we're going to start in chapter 5 for today. When I came home to West Egg that night, I was afraid for a moment that my house was on fire. Two o'clock and the whole corner of the peninsula was blazing with light, which fell unreal on the shrubbery and made thin, elongating glints upon the roadside wires. Turning a corner, I saw that it was Gatsby's house, lit from tower to cellar. At first I thought it was another party, a wild rout that had resolved itself into hide and seek or sardines in the box, with all the house thrown open to the game. But there wasn't a sound. Only wind in the trees which blew the wires and made the lights go off and on again as if the house had winked into the darkness. As my taxi groaned away, I saw Gatsby walking towards me across his lawn. Your place looks like the world's fair, I said. Does it? He turned his eyes towards her absently. I've been glancing into some of the rooms. Let's go to Coney Island, old sport, in my car. It's too late. Well, I suppose we take a plunge in the swimming pool. I haven't made use of it all summer. I've got to go to bed. All right. And he waited, looking at me with suppressed eagerness. I talked with Miss Baker, I said after a moment. I'm going to call up Daisy tomorrow and invite her over here to tea. Oh, that's all right, he said carelessly. I don't want you to put you to any trouble. What day would suit you? No, what day would suit you, he corrected me quickly. I don't want to put you to any trouble, you see. Well, how about the day after tomorrow? He considered for a moment. Then, with reluctance, I want to get the grass cut, he said. We both looked down at the grass. There was a sharp line where my ragged lawn ended and the darker, well-kept expanse of his began. I suspected that he meant my grass. There's another little thing. He said uncertainly and hesitated. Would you rather put it off for a few days? I asked. Oh, it isn't about that. At, at least he fumbled with a series of beginnings. Why, I thought, why, look here, old sport, you don't make much money, do you? Not very much. This seemed to reassure him, and he continued more confidently. I thought you didn't, if you'll pardon my... Well, you see... I carry on a little business on the side, a sort of sideline, you understand. And I thought, if you don't make very much, you're selling bonds, aren't you, old sport? Well, I'm trying to. Well, this would interest you. It wouldn't take up much of your time, and you might pick up a nice bit of money. It happens to be a rather confidential sort of thing. So we get a kind of inkling again into the, the underworld connections of Gatsby here, and 
we kind of have been hinted at somebody said he was a bootlegger remember we were saying in the 1920s we've got prohibition there's no alcohol legally to be sold and yet we know the, there's an awful lot of alcohol around in this case here he's talking now about bond fraud so a lot of the time with the kind of banking world that we've got in the 1920s here some of the time because you're doing things on paper you could forge or steal the numbers of bond certificates this would be where you have let's say five thousand dollars and instead of having it in cash you put it into a bond you would get a certificate to say this can be cashed in for five thousand dollars it would have a unique serial number on the top of it and when you take it to the bank and go and cash it in they would check that unique serial number with a sort of central database or phone somebody to go and check and at that stage they would say yep this is legitimate here's five thousand dollars in money if you can steal those serial numbers and you can reproduce the bond certificates that you've got you could then go into banks in small towns and we hear that we mention of is that what he thinks is a small town go to a small town that's not used to dealing with bond certificates and you could hand them over the counter the people who may not deal with them a great deal would say right there's your money thanks very much and if you do this all over the country you're making hefty amounts of money again it points to illegality either bootlegging or his kind of connections with the gambling uh, and rigging of Meyer Wolf scheme or with the idea now of this kind of bond uh, fraud. Uh, Gavin, you had a question. Uh, why does it look illegal again? Or legal in the first place? Oh, so to begin with, they had the temperance movement. Uh, there was a big concern around, it was sort of linked to Christianity in some ways, but there's a big concern around uh, the immorality, I guess, of drinking. And it was causing problems. It caused problems of drunkenness. It caused problems with, uh, you know, domestic abuse and people not being able to work and people spending all their money on alcohol, etc. So it, there was a temperance movement that said, just do away with alcohol. They then outlawed it. But of course, people were keen to continue drinking and people flouted the law. And it wasn't just an issue that affected uh, people in poverty. It was an issue where lots of people from right up and down the social spectrum wanted to go out and have a drink. And therefore, in some ways, they sort of turned a blind eye to it. Uh, and it had this huge burgeoning kind of effect of everybody uh, kind of being able to access alcohol. Somebody needs to provide it. And the people that were providing it were often uh, not the nicest of people. And the people then controlling it, like drugs, I suppose, these days, the people controlling it then get into violent fights with each other because there's a lot of money to be made within this. That's where you get into your sort of Al Capone type stuff. Why did they stop it? I don't know. Or like, I guess, clearly it wasn't working and they turned back to that. But every now and again, I mean, even in Scotland at the moment, you've got minimum pricing on alcohol where, again, they're trying to say there's an issue with drunkenness or the effects of alcohol that they can have on people and families and therefore that's their strategy at the moment is if they make it more expensive it's less easy to get hold of cheap uh, ways to get drunk but you know there's a lot of arguments on both sides of that okay moving quickly on to science so we've got this idea of bonds and he again asks nick nick presumably not particularly interested in getting involved so halfway down 53 we're trying oh you're selling bonds aren't you old sport and he says trying to and kind of goes on with the wee bit there I, I've got my hands full, says Nick. I'm much obliged, but I couldn't take on any more work. You wouldn't have to do any business with Wolfsheim. Evidently, he thought that I wasn't shying away from the connection mentioned at lunch, but I assured him he was wrong. He waited a moment longer, hoping I'd begin a conversation. But I was too absorbed to be responsive, so he went unwillingly home. The evening had made me light-headed and happy. I think I walked into a deep sleep as I entered my front door, so I don't know whether or not Gatsby went to Coney Island, or for how many hours he glanced into rooms while his house glazed godly on. I called up Daisy from the office next morning and invited her to come to tea. Don't bring Tom, I warned her. What? Don't bring Tom? Oh, who is Tom? She asked innocently. The day agreed upon was pouring rain. At 11 o'clock, a man in a raincoat, dragging a lawnmower, tapped at my front door and said that Mr. Gatsby had sent him over to cut my grass. This reminded me that I'd forgotten to tell my Finn to come back, so 
I drove into West Egg Village to search for her among soggy whitewashed alleys and to buy some cups and lemons and flowers. The flowers were unnecessary, for at two o'clock a greenhouse arrived from Gatsby's with innumerable receptacles to contain it. An hour later the front door opened nervously and Gatsby in a white flannel suit, silver shirt and gold coloured tie hurried in. Remember what we've said about Gatsby and this idea of just how tacky he is with his money and just how obvious it is that he does not or is not part of the old money elite that Tom and Daisy come from. So although he is up there thinking, right, this is what rich people wear, we see him as being somebody who very clearly is putting on, you know, a bit of a show. Scratch the surface. It doesn't seem like he is indeed what he says he is, inherited money, etc. Uh, is everything all right? He asked immediately. The grass looks fine, if that's what you mean. What grass? He inquired blankly. Oh, the grass in the yard. And he looked out the window at it, but judging from his expression, I don't believe he saw a thing. Yeah, yeah, it looks very good, he remarked vaguely. One of the papers said they thought the rain would stop about four. I think it was the journal. Have you got everything you need in the shape of, of tea? I took him into the pantry where he looked a little reproachfully at the fin. Together, we scrutinised the 12 lemon cakes from the delicatessen shop. Will they do? I asked. Yeah, of course, of course, they're fine. And he added hollowly, old sport. The rain cooled about half past three to a damp mist through which occasional thin drops swam like dew. Gatsby looked with vacant eyes through a copy of Clay's Economics, Starting at the finished tread that shook the kitchen floor and peering towards the bleared windows from time to time as if a series of invisible but alarming happenings were taking place outside. Finally, he got up and informed me in an uncertain voice that he was going home. Why is that? Well, nobody's coming to tea. It's, it's, it's too late. And he looked at his watch as if there was some pressing demand on his time elsewhere. I can't wait all day. Don't be silly. It's two minutes to four. He sat down, miserably, as if I'd pushed him, and simultaneously there was the sound of a motor turning into my lane. We both jumped up, and a little harrowed myself, I went out into the yard. Under the dripping bare lilac trees, a large open car was coming up the drive. It stopped. Daisy's face, tipped sideways beneath a three-cornered lavender hat, looked at me with a bright, ecstatic smile. Is this absolutely where you live, my dearest one? The exhilarating ripple of her voice was a wild tonic in the rain. I had to follow the sound of it for a moment, up and down with my ear, alone before any words came through, and a damp streak of hair lay like a dash of blue paint across her cheek, and her hand was wet with glistening drops as I took it to help her from the car. Are you in love with me? She said low in my ear. Or why did I have to come alone? Oh, that's the secret of Castle Rackrent. Tell your chauffeur to go far away and spend an hour. Come back in an hour, Ferdy. And then she said in a grave murmur, His name is Ferdy. Does the gasoline affect his nose? I don't think so, she said innocently. Why? We went in, and to my overwhelming surprise, the living room was deserted. Right, that's where we're going to pause for the moment.